I can see I'm going to have to try this again. Good afternoon. That was much better. Welcome to this afternoon's session. Um, it's our next to last here at the Sheraton. We're going to be discussing the Meyerhoff experience. Can it be replicated? Dr. Rabowski noted in his remarks in the program that to understand the strength and the character of the Meyerhoff program is to understand the meaning and the power of community. What an honor and a thrill it is to gather again in community for our last two sessions today. I'm not going to take very much time from our um, panel, but I, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Marion Johnson Thompson. She is Director of Education and Biomedical Research Development for the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. She received BS and MS degrees in microbiology from Howard University and her PhD in molecular virology from Georgetown University Medical School. At NIEHS, at NIH, and at other external forums, Dr. Johnson Thompson has led many initiatives focused on health disparities and training the next generation of biomedical researchers. Dr. Johnson Thompson is Professor Emerita of Biology and Environmental Sciences at the University of the District of Columbia and Adjunct Professor in the Department of Maternal and Child Health in the School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Who better to moderate our panel today? Please welcome Dr. Marion Johnson Thompson. Thank you for that kind introduction and good afternoon to all. My favorite area is indeed academe, and it's a primary reason why I appreciate working with the Meyerhoff students. In the STEM community, Students are our most precious resources. Others may cite funding, but the availability of a student pipeline is extremely critical to the future success of our nation and our future ability to compete globally. I want to congratulate current students, alumni, faculty, and staff, Dr. Rabowski and Mr. Meyerhoff, and all who've played a role in this celebration. Since the beginning, you have invested and believed, and now you are realizing immeasurable positive returns. In the stock market, we can measure returns, but this investment, and I say this to Mr. Meyerhoff in particular, is so vast, so overarching and reaching, it's impossible to measure, but we all know it's great. Today we can see, all see the tsunami, the tsunami. And that's what Mike Sumner said last night. He used that so eloquently to describe the <coughs> emergence of this program. And I really like that idea. But we can see this large group of STEM graduates rapidly entering graduate and professional schools and where we're also beginning to see their emergence in the workforce. It is indeed an honor to be among this distinguished group of panelists and to moderate this session because this program has been identified as the program for training a diverse group of outstanding STEM graduates who go on to succeed in obtaining advanced STEM and professional degrees. Beginning with its many successes with African-American males and African-American women, other underrepresented minorities, and now all applicants who are committed to increasing the underrepresentation of minorities in the sciences, the Meyerhoff program has demonstrated in a very relatively short period of time that it has the prescription for ensuring that the scientific enterprise consists of a diverse group of outstanding, accomplished scholars committed to serving their local and national communities as well as the global society. If you attended last night's banquet, you had a chance to hear from many alumni. What a wonderful representation. It must have been absolutely inspiring for those who are beginning, those who are in the middle, or those who are finishing their training periods to see that those who came before them and see their successes. 
What better role models could any aspiring individual have to see someone like them achieving? I particularly appreciate the statements from the couple who said that during one of their darkest hours, when they thought they couldn't go on, and this happened to many of us, that Dr. Freeman listened but went on to announce to a very large gathering that they were completing their degrees. As a result, they had no choice but to finish. <laughs> and they're extremely happy today that they received that last shot of adrenaline. And this leads me to another very important aspect of this program, and that is of expectations. Expectations and positive reinforcements of expectations. In my long career in this business, I have witnessed that the brightest mind can be challenged and often knocked down if expectations aren't there. This is why students with the same aspirations, that of choosing a graduate and or professional degree in the STEM area and identical academic achievements are six times less likely to achieve their aspirations <coughs> when they decline a Meyerhoff scholarship and choose to attend another so-called more as prestigious institution. So the expectations and the Meyerhoff's 14 key components represent the prescription as written by the doctor, that is Dr. Rabowski. Though not a physician, as with all-time basketball star Julius Irving, Dr. J, who also isn't a physician, but knew how to operate on the basketball floor, Dr. Rabowski has a prescription and he knows how to operate when it comes to producing STEM careers. His patients are alive and have plenty of life. He and his staff have written the prescription. Can others do the same and keep the emergence of STEM graduates alive? That is the subject of this panel. And with that, we'll begin. Each panelist will introduce himself or herself. All have had some association with the program, either an alumnus or they have taught as a faculty, a funder, a mentor, what have you. Collectively, they will tell you not only whether this program can be replicated, but why it must be replicated. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear? OK, very good. For sake of time, I'll say that I'm Wanda Ward. I'm currently at the National Science Foundation, and perhaps I can tell you more through Q&A. But I'd like to get into my five minutes of uh, conversation with you. Uh, I've been asked to uh, talk with you from the federal perspective and I'd like to expand that just a bit and talk with you from the federal and the national perspective. And they're not quite the same, as you'll see in a moment. But I want to say that I continue to be inspired by the excellence that's demonstrated throughout all that you do at the individual level, at the institutional level, and at the community level. For embroiled, without your, embroiled throughout your scientific expertise and pursuit is what, what I find especially unique in that it is embroiled and I'd say permeated and undergirded by an abiding sense of humanity. And I think that that's quite, quite important on a number of levels. And what I'm also quite impressed is the large number of what I would call psychosocially healthy individuals that are produced through this program um, uh, uh, co comparable to the scientific, technological, and uh, engineering expertise that, uh, that you're equipped with. From the National Science Foundation perspective, that is the uh, federal perspective, I would say that the answer to the fundamental question of can this be replicated is yes with caveats, and I'd say it can be replicated plus more. Uh, in the scientific uh, world, replication means doing the same thing the same way to hopefully uh, replicate the same results. I think the Meyerhoff uh, experience supersedes replication alone, and I'll talk to you in a moment about that, about adaptability and taking context in, into account. 
but you've gone on to establish a network, the Meyerhoff Network, that continues to be visible in your civic responsibility of increasing the number of underrepresented minorities who excel in all STEM careers. What has to be modeled and replicated are the program values exemplified through Meyerhoff, the program community that's built, including significant family involvement. And so the experience has to be uh, 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 regarded as a model of the investment in realistic science-based aspirations and the advancement of an entire community with the bottom line being that excellence begets excellence. From the National Science Foundation perspective, it is that demonstrated what we would call our jargon uh, merit-reviewed excellence that, that uh, UMBC has competed well in a number of our federally funded programs, uh, Meyerhoff being supported partially uh, along with many other funders through programs like the LS AMP, uh, other aspects of the Alliances for Graduate uh, Education and the Professoriate Eigert Awards. Uh, the list is rather impressive of uh, awards that, the, that uh, UMBC overall has garnered from the NSF along with other supporters, funders. I have just a couple of slides. You've heard throughout all yesterday and you know very well that from the national perspective, the importance of developing all talent is simply to maintain a robust uh, S&E enterprise. We're all cognizant of international competition, workforce mobility, combined with a surge of international collaboration in STEM fields, making this kind of effort uh, critical. Within this, uh, next slide please, uh, within this is the snapshot that we think graphically captures the importance of the development of all U.S. talent, notably uh, the paucity of talent that resides at the very top of that pyramid. A number of things uh, could be said, but I would say, go on to the next slide, I have one minute left, that if you look at, <laughs> and I'm determined to, to stay within this, these are the Meyerhoff components. These are critical components through the LS AMP program, which has been demonstrated by a national third party evaluation to exceed uh, the, the, the national rate of production of uh, BS and those who go on to receive graduate degrees, but also an activity that some from UMBC, a nationwide activity called building engineering and science talent. We call these design principles as opposed to elements that had to be um, uh, replicated one by one. And the essence, I think, of all of these, if you look at all of those, is that design principles comprise a single package. You can't pull out one of these elements from the Meyerhoff program or for the AMP or from the best design principles and achieve the kinds of goals that you see achieved here. We also recognized uh, that failure is a part of the learning curve but that doesn't mean that you stop where you are. You build on the lessons learned and go on and work towards success. That execution spells the difference. What often sets best in class apart is not a difference in kind, but in degree. It's the quality of teaching, mentoring, research opportunities that produces the kind of talent uh, that's needed. And again, context is critical. You have to adapt to the circumstances, institutional circumstances, in which uh, one uh, uh, currently resides. Out of respect, I will stop there. I'm Isaiah Warner, I'm from Louisiana State University. I was first introduced to the Meyerhoff program by Willie Pearson, as I recall who was on the advisory committee for the Meyerhoff program and suggested that I be added to the Meyerhoff uh, advisory committee. And it was an eye-opening experience. Uh, at the undergraduate level, I'd never seen anything like this before because at LSU, we had already started producing a vast number of African-American PhDs in chemistry. In fact, to this day, 10 years later, we're still the number one producer of African-American PhDs in chemistry. Uh, 
So after seeing the Meyerhoff experience, I recognized that something like that was needed at the undergraduate level at, at LSU. I'd seen so many students who had come through at the undergraduate level and it just essentially I knew that these students were bright and they were not coming through with the kinds of degrees that they needed. So how was I going to do this? First of all, I need to get some funding. So I approached the National Science Foundation and said that the Meyerhoff program is a great program, but it's not really a model program. I said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, nothing is a model unless it can be replicated. And I convinced enough people at NSF to entertain a proposal for us, from us, that such that we can try to replicate the Meyerhoff program at uh, Louisiana State University. So we got the funding for that. And at the same time, I knew that my administration would not give me the funding for the staff, and I was not going to be able to do it by myself. So I approached Research Corporation and say, look, we're going to get this funding probably from NSF. I had no idea whether we were going to get it or not, but I, <laughs> I convinced Research Corporation that we needed to have the staff. And they made a proposition, okay, we'll put in the staff under one condition. And I thought it was a terrible condition at the time, but now in retrospect it's a wonderful condition. And that is that the... LSU would gradually take over payment of the staff. And as of next year, LSU will be paying for the entire staff, which was a wonderful idea that I didn't recognize at the time. So, so started our program about five years ago called the Louisiana STEM program, a lost STEM. And that program is now producing its first graduates this year. Those graduates have done a number of things, and I'll talk about those in a minute, but the most important thing is we created this last STEM program pattern after Meyerhoff, but at the same time with some differences. For example, in Louisiana, schools are still very much segregated. In Baton Rouge, uh, East Baton Rouge Parish, which is 50% African American, the student population in the public schools pretty close to 80% African Americans. Our students go to primarily private and parochial schools. 35% of all students in Louisiana go to uh, private and parochial schools. So the first thing I have to address in my program is diversity. The first thing that on, on our uh, selection weekend, we meet with all the parents and the students, whites on one side, blacks on the other side, because they're not accustomed to being together. So we have to address that issue. And there are other issues that we have to address which are not necessarily issues in the uh, Meyerhoff program. but. As a result of that, we're graduating students who are now winning awards. We've had students come out of our program who were the first Gilliam Fellows, which is the graduate fellowship given by the uh, uh, Howard Hughes program. We have students who have won Goldwater scholarships, and we are producing leaders. And in fact, one of the persons on our selection committee is our Honors College uh, Dean, and she said that if she could select students, all of our students in the Honors College, the way we select the STEM students, she would do that. But in, uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, possible to do that. So the final point I want to address is sustainability. What is going to happen when these NSF funds run out? And that's a question that I'm still pondering. Because I know that last year when I put in, we have been renewed for NSF, but when I put in my renewal, renewal, I asked the university to stand by me and back me up and let me give these students four-year scholarships. And they wouldn't do it. And so I could only offer these students one-year scholarships. And I offered 35 one-year scholarships. 28 of those students accepted those one-year scholarship because of the STEM program and its reputation. After we got funded, I came to them and I said, how many of you knew that you accepted one-year scholarships? And all of the hands went up. And they said, well, we have one question, Dr. Warner. I said, what's that? What are we going to do next year? I said, the time to ask that question was before you signed those contracts. <laughs> Well, I pleasantly told them that we had been renewed, and they were excited and elated about that. But those young people had a lot of confidence in me and the fact that I could get additional funding. I don't think I'll be able to renew that beyond the second year, beyond the second term, rather. It's a five-year renewal. So beyond this next term, I'm, I'm, I'm anxiously wondering where am I going to get the additional funds from to want, uh, run this program. There are not many Freeman Robowskis running universities across this country, 
who could just smile, give you a smile, and you turn all of your money over to Freeman. <laughs> Freeman is a very unique gentleman, as all of you found out and know. But uh, we have to try to find some way of keeping this program going because it is doing something for LSU. There's an island of students now that are believing in diversity, working together in a family-like atmosphere, and doing very well, exceptionally well in college. We need more programs like the Meyerhoff. Thank you. Did you come in early? Wow. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Laurel Southern from Cornell University, and I'm the den mother for undergraduate research and outreach in biology. And in that wonderful position, I work with students who are interested in the life sciences at Cornell. And I want to tell you a little bit about the structure of Cornell so that you understand the complexity of other institutions. And most, I'm, I'm really addressing my comments to the young people in the, in the audience because you have been trained to be leaders. We expect that you'll be leaders. And in some short amount of time, like the wonderful person at the end here, she's about to start a faculty position and move up the ladder to be the dean of the medical school at Johns Hopkins. So um, <laughs> listen up, because this is what, you're, what challenges you'll hit. So Cornell University, as I'm sure you know, is an Ivy League. It's a northern Ivy League. There's a lot of snow there. It's cold. Um, it's, we beat ourselves up because it's sort of not that tropical. But more importantly is that it is seven different colleges at Cornell, seven different undergraduate colleges, and all of them have equally powerful deans. So I work with students from the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. We have students studying life sciences in the College of Human Ecology and students studying biomedical interests in the College of Engineering. So in order to implement any kind of program, I have to get four people, four deans, to agree that this is a good idea. In an academic setting, that's virtually impossible. And what, so what you learn to do is you learn to work with who you can feel are with you and you move forward. And being at UMBC is, this place is like Camelot. And uh, I don't know if you guys have seen or heard the play, but there's a final song in Camelot about, you know, go, go tell everyone you know about the miracle of Camelot. And that's what this is. There are few Freeman Rabowskis. There are few staff situations where they all love you and they support you and sometimes it's a little hard sometimes they tell the truth and a little bit more where you have faculty who go to bed every night knowing that they've helped you and that they've pushed your career a little bit forward and where you have colleagues and peers that you work with and you communicate with and you study with and that you try to make sure that you all excel so this place is Camelot. It's an amazing place. And other places are trying. And so we at Cornell actually last summer came down here and visited with the Meyerhoff program. We spent the day talking to advisors and faculty and the, and the first year Meyerhoff students. And we went back to Cornell and we scratched our heads and we said, what can we really do? What of this can we replicate? And so we picked out pieces of it. And I'm happy that we're in our second year of a program that is called the Biology Scholars Program. It, um, we don't have funding. And so the students that are in this program are volunteers. They sign up during the first few days of their freshman time at Cornell when, as you guys remember, you're all, I can do anything. I can, I'm this, I'm that. And then um, we offer for them facilitated study groups. And Ty McRae, who is a Meyer office here, and she's been involved with the program and the study groups for the first two years. It's 20 students. We have 400 new biology majors every year. So we have 20 students in this program. <coughs> At the end of the first year, a lot of them had struggled to keep their academic numbers up. And so they decided to leave the program, or we decided to have them leave the program. And that's another thing I want you to think about. I'm, my talk is more about what challenges we have. So is that right? 
Is that what we need to do? Or are those students that actually we need to, to work even more with? So we do a lot of advising and we do a lot of study groups. Now, if you're a Meyerhoff student, you've got to be sitting out there going, she hasn't said anything about research yet. And so that's the other piece that, that's a challenge for us and that we have a lot of faculty doing a lot of research, writing a lot of grants, but at an Ivy League school, teaching and mentoring isn't the top of the list for um, tenure and for improvement. And so that's a group of people that you'll have to work with and that I have to work with. And again, some people you can't change. Just like Isaiah mentioned, that when he talks to the, in the prospective students, the white students are, are here and the students of color are there. And at Cornell and at places like Ivy Leagues, there are faculty who believe and will help, and there's faculty that it takes a little longer, and you'll come up against that. But you begin to work with one person at a time. They realize how wonderful it is to work with a bright, amazing student, and then they tell the, the person in the next office, and it grows. We encourage our students to do summer opportunities elsewhere because we don't have a medical school right near us. Our students don't see what biomedical research can be. And our goal is that all of our students will graduate with honors, will write an honors thesis, and will do research. So it's a challenging task, but it's a fabulous task. And again, as you heard yesterday, all of you that visit, or all of you that graduate, you'll go on and you'll influence thousands of students. And so slowly, this program will be replicated, and as other panelists have said, what you guys have here is you have a president who, who knows you, you have a president who cares about you, you have faculty who care about you, and you care about each other. And those are critical, important values that we have to replicate. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Giddings. I'm the director of the STEM Scholars Program at Winston-Salem State University. For those of you who do not know where Winston-Salem State University is, it's in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, <laughs> somebody knows. Uh, we, we are indeed honored to join you for this um, celebration. Uh, before I talk a little bit about the STEM Scholars Program, let, let me extend greetings from our new chancellor at WSSU, uh, Dr. Donald J. Reeves. The STEM Scholars Program was started in 2004 by uh, former Chancellor Harold Martin. And during the 2003 year, he sent a team actually to UMBC to review and, and evaluate the Meyerhoff program. He wanted something like this at WSSU. And as a result of what he saw, he decided to implement the program in 2004, which was the year that I came on board at WSSU. The program has five components, the Summer Bridge program, the curriculum, of course, where we uh, collaborate with faculty, the co-curriculum, community service, and summer internships. In 2005, the university committed a significant amount of money for scholarships for the STEM Scholars Program, which enabled us to enroll some of the best and brightest students in the state of North Carolina. And I'm fortunate to have several of them with me today, and I would like to ask them to stand. superstars. <laughs> to be considered for a full scholarship uh, as a high school senior, students must have a minimum 1100 SAT score or equivalent ACT score and a 3.5 high school GPA. They must complete a minimum of 30 semester hours per academic year, so the scholarship is for four years. Many of them um, take courses well beyond, well beyond the minimum and have a lot of flexibility in their undergraduate experience to do things such as research, community service, and what have you. Currently, there are 35 students in the program. The mean GPA is 3.6. The mean SAT is 1150. 
and the current SAT range for the cohort is 1330 through 1050. In terms of interventions and programs, STEM scholars do um, get one-on-one -on -one advising. We have monthly meetings where we talk about issues related to graduate education and preparation for the next level. Uh, they attend conferences and present at conferences as it pertains to their summer research that they conduct. And we also have an annual retreat where we bring in guest speakers. Uh, in many cases, those who are similar to Meyerhoff graduates and, and, and many of the young PhDs that I see at this conference, they come back and talk about graduate education. And it really helps them to put things in perspective um, when they see people that are very close to their generation who have completed the PhD program or program that, uh, or something that they, as they aspire to do as well. In terms of outcomes, uh, since 2005, 49 STEM scholars have participated in summer internships. Uh, in, in terms of places where they've interned, five of those include the original Ivy League schools, six public Ivies, two Southern Ivies, and several other prestigious schools, including, from what I learned on Wednesday, UMBC. <laughs> Since 2004, 62 students have participated in the program. The current retention rate for the program is 83%. And uh, to date, Many of the students um, who are in the program, actually that number is 52, they have either graduated as STEM scholars or they're still in the program as STEM scholars. Actually, 23 students have graduated from the STEM scholars program. And as far as we know, in terms of those we, we've been able to track anyway, 11 of those are actually in graduate and professional education programs. Five students will graduate in May. One has been accepted to the Masters in Medical Science program at Indiana University, and another is waiting on the offer from Georgia Tech or either NC State. Um, with all programs, there are challenges, and um, I'd like to just address those very quickly. Sometimes there's changes in leadership, and that does threaten continuity in a program. And one of the challenges that I have with some of the students is, is actually um, getting them to think outside of North Carolina in terms of opportunities. We have that conversation a lot. I'm winning a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of successes, uh, in 2006, um, the STEM Scholars Program was actually on the front page of the major newspaper in Winston-Salem, I'm looking at the cue card here, just want to make sure. Uh, another story, that, and I'll close very quickly, another story that I'd like to share with you, um, I called it from Burundi to WSSU. A young lady actually was able to escape Rwanda, um, spent um, some time in one of the camps in, in, in a neighboring village, if you will, ended up at WSSU in 2003, um, I met her in 2004, talked her into applying for an internship at UNC Chapel Hill. Her life changed after that um, tremendously, tremendously. Um, the next year, she decided um, she didn't need any assistance. She applied for an internship at Harvard and got it. And when she interviewed, um, first of all, let me say she was recruited very heavily by Vanderbilt, Ohio State University, and Ohio University. And when she interviewed at Ohio University, the interview went something like this, according to what she shared with me. She said, well, they didn't really look at my credentials. Once they looked at my application package, they said, well, you've done everything that we expect a student to do who's interested in graduate school. Let's talk about what you're interested in and how we might help you. That was the nature of her interview. Uh, how does that tie into the Meyerhoff program? We took what the student had already accomplished before I got there and applied the, the research, summer research internship component to her experiences. And once she developed those um, levels of confidence, if you will, and, and those experience, the grad, experiences that graduate faculty look for, it was just a matter of her deciding where she wanted to go. Um, she's now at Ohio University um, in the Master of Public Health program 
and she's trying to decide now whether she wants to pursue the MD or the PhD. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Pam Baker. I, I teach cell biology and immunology and am the director of uh, research and scholarship at Bates College, which is in Maine. Um, so just to start with a little bit of uh, shameless self-promotion, <laughs> uh, we're at uh, a college of the liberal arts and sciences, four-year residential college, uh, and all of our students do research. Our faculty are expected to do research. So when you're thinking careers, if you're interested in combining teaching and research, uh, please consider places like Bates, the liberal arts colleges. So, and that's the end of that ad. <laughs> uh, so Bates actually has what I think is an interesting and important history. Uh, we were founded in 1855 uh, by abolitionists. And from the beginning, uh, have enrolled women and uh, people of color. Uh, and that's been a commitment from the very beginning. Uh, in fact, Benjamin Mays, who was uh, one of Martin Luther King's mentors, is a Bates graduate, class of 1920. So it's a history that we're proud of. Uh, but uh, although we've done well in uh, getting women through the ranks of the faculty. Um, we're not yet doing very well in getting substantial numbers uh, of students of color or faculty of color, and that's our priority at this time. So uh, about six years ago, uh, I met Ernestine Baker, and she came up to Bates and told us about your program, and um, we immediately knew that uh, this was the program we wanted to emulate. Uh, and it took about three or four years before we had all the pieces in place and had the funding from Howard Hughes Medical Institute to get it started. Uh, but we enrolled our first cohort last summer. So we enrolled 11 students uh, for a six-week summer bridge, which is pretty much modeled after yours. Uh, the students take two courses, uh, a math course and a chemistry course that are not remedial courses at all. They are accelerated introduction to college level work. Uh, the chemistry course is also a lab course, so there's an introduction to research methods. Uh, and it's also a first year seminar, so for us that means it's a writing intensive course. And the faculty advisor from that course stays as the faculty advisor through the students first two years um, so uh, it was a tremendously successful recruiting tool for us uh, not just to recruit those 11 students but along with having that bridge we brought in double that number uh, of students of color which pretty much doubled our numbers <laughs> um, 2% of our students are African American, another 2% are Latino, Latina. So we have a long way to go. Um, and we also have an even longer way to go uh, in recruiting and retaining students into science and math. Um, of the students who do come uh, across all of Bates, 25% of our students graduate uh, with majors in science and math, but of the underrepresented groups, it's much lower percentage than that. So uh, recruitment and retention are our goals. And uh, I just wanted to s take my last minute here to uh, say a little bit about the challenge of uh, trying to start a summer bridge in a place where we've never had a summer school. We've never had courses for academic credit in the summer. So if I could have the first slide. Um, oh, go back one. <laughs> so uh, you've really got to start early. As I said, this took us about three years to get the pieces in place. 
uh, and you've got to involve everyone. We had faculty buy-in from the beginning. It was a faculty-initiated program. Uh, but being faculty, we were completely naive about all the administrative uh, steps that it takes <laughs> to start a program like this. So if I could have the next slide. So I'm not going to go through this, obviously. It's just a visual to indicate the huge number of offices, even in a college the size of ours, that uh, have to be involved. And the Dean of Students office was essential, uh, getting the residential piece, the residential life piece in place, and the student TAs and the student fellows in the dorm uh, were essential. Um, and I guess the last slide is similar to this one. So um, I just want to thank all of you uh, for inviting me. I've known the program for years, but this is actually my first uh, opportunity to be here and to meet you all and it's just been such an honor I'm, I really am thankful for being here thank you good afternoon everyone I'm dr. Crystal Watkins and I'm part of the m3 cohort I uh, <laughs> I graduated from UMBC in 1995, and I'm currently the Chief Resident in Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins, and I'll be starting a faculty position there in July. And I'm just really happy to be here. I've just been overwhelmed this weekend because um, in thinking about replicating the Meyerhoff, well, first I'll say I first learned about the Meyerhoff program through my dad. My father met Mrs. Baker, and he was excited to learn that there was a way to finance my education that uh, he could save some money and not have to write checks. <laughs> and um, But I think the scholarship has been so much more to everyone, which has been represented by this weekend. And really replicating the success of the Meyerhoff program, I think about um, almost, uh, it's like, trying to make my grandmother's peach cobbler from her recipe. So if followed you know, generally, you know, it'll lead to a delicious dessert, but there's always some preparation that's involved in that particular secret ingredient. And you also have to, it also invokes some type of devotion to excellence and that all the necessary ingredients must be gathered and incorporated together into the cobbler in just the right order so it tastes just like grandma's. So when I think about the Meyerhoff program, what is that particular inv ingredient? What's the recipe of success for the Meyerhoff program? And we've heard this afternoon about different ingredients. We've talked about summer bridge, um, the financial <coughs> aspects of things, Dr. Rabowski, Mrs. Baker, the supportive staff. Uh, but for me, the secret real ingredient has really been mentoring. Mentoring just not, not just at the undergraduate level, but also in graduate school and um, you know, as I continue in my endeavors in, in, the career, in my career. And it really started as an undergrad uh, with my network of Meyerhoff brothers and sisters. It, your mentor doesn't have to necessarily just be someone outside of the program. And then also the Meyerhoff staff and then my personal mentor, Dr. Morgan. And I actually met uh, Dr. Lisa Morgan when she was a postdoctoral fellow, and now 17 years later, she and her husband, Athol, are still some of my close and personal friends. And they still give me some of what I call that tough love mentoring and intrusive advising. And I think that's the, <laughs> we all know about that, don't we? And um, I think that is the key to kind of, you know, you have these dreams and aspirations, but staying on task, I think you always need that external person to help you to focus, focus, focus. And even practical advice, for instance, um, Dr. Morgan would also tell me about, you know, organic chemistry. That's the key class that you need in order to get into medical school. And doing research during the summer, not just doing a research project, but talking about authorship, where you're going to be on, as, as an author on the paper, those kinds of practical things. And then other mentors like Dr. Jocelyn Sprague, who's here from Harvard, and the SHRP program, having that opportunity to do research at Harvard and being able to have the opportunity extended to lots of different Meyerhoffs to have that research experience that gives you the foundation to then go into graduate school and be um, prepared to have a successful research career. The other thing is um, um, having mentors to encourage you to have a balance. Um, Dr. Morgan was also a nice inspiration to me because she was a mother. So I, so I didn't feel like I had to choose between having a successful research career and then also having a family. 
And then at graduate school, I mean, these people are still continue to be um, critical in my life. But I think also picking the, the, fam the, the family that we hear and have here in the Meyerhoff program is very unique. So I think when you're choosing a graduate school or choosing a workplace or choosing a research lab, it's important to find someone who has the same type of, uh, that has the same support systems. And so I chose Johns Hopkins because there's a similar setup there, faculty there, mainly on the medicine side that have an interest in minority students and minority success. And my research mentor, Dr. Snyder, is also just very critical in making sure that I had op different opportunities. And then also being an advocate. I think when you're in graduate school and then when you're a young professor, it's not about when you're gonna have that um, challenge or, or if, if you're gonna have that challenge, but when, because we all will have that bump in the road or that particular uh, class or professor or grant or something like that that can kind of get in the way and make us question, you know, why are we spending 24 years of school <laughs> to get to this point? So I think it's important to have those critical mentors around. And what I'm really impressed with this weekend is that we have, in order to talk, talk about uh, Dr. Ward talked about sustainability and community. I think we're at a critical mass that in order to continue to um, capitalize on that special ingredient, which are Meyerhoff mentors, I think we're now at a critical mass where we can mentor each other. We should pass the torch on so that um, you know we have lots of young professors and um, graduate students and people in the workforce where we can actually use all of that talent and inspiration to help each other and continue to sustain the program. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Lola Iniola Adefasa. I am a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Michigan, and I was an M7. Um, I got my degree here in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Um, so I guess I, I was invited here because I've been in both worlds. I've been part of the Meyerhoff program and seeing how the Meyerhoff program functions. And I'm now on the other side of things where I'm actually in the classroom and I'm observing students that I happen to be at a university where there isn't currently um, a program in existence that, that is similar to the Meyerhoff program. So I wanted to start and I want my conversation to be along the line of why should the Meyerhoff program be replicated? Um, we, we may sit here and talk about can it be replicated <coughs> in giving the information to the people that are going to fund this types of program. There has to be a motivation component to, to that conversation. There is a critical need for diversity in science and engineering. and. There are huge challenges right now preventing those diversity to, to occur. So I want to start by um, talking about some of the aspects of the Meyer program that I personally thought um, helped me be successful um, at UMBC while I was here, as well as during my graduate program. The first experience was the Summer Bridge experience that most of the panelists have talked about, which brings um, students together um, early on, and it really gives them this sort of small environment to get introduced to the new world of college life, of engineering and science. Uh, next. And then you have the program value that from day one instills this idea of scientific research and a PhD program to young students across the board. I think that's very key because after five years, or four years of hearing that you need to get a PhD, at some point you start to believe it. And I think that that, <laughs> that, that is very, very important. Um, the next and final, uh, uh, the next one is the program community. The social and academic support system and the study group that existed throughout the program. I would say now that I'm on the other side as a faculty member, I think this is actually one of the key components of the program that needs to absolutely get replicated across the board. Mm -hmm. This completely gave us the strength to continue going in the, in the face of, of hardship. And it's actually one of the things that helped me a lot in graduate school because I knew what it means to have a community. So in graduate school, I knew I needed that community and I, I was able to go and seek that support out to help me through those difficult times. So that's very important. I think there's one more. 
the advising and mentoring. Having somebody there to give you the right information at the right time is very critical to academic success at any level. A bad advice could keep you from achieving a goal that you have potential in achieving. So having said, highlighted all this important stuff, now in my classroom, here is what I see. I'm, I teach a junior level chemical engineering course at Michigan. I have about 120 students in this course. The difference though is it's not like this audience. If I had this audience, um, <laughs> it would be a great time for me in the classroom. <laughs> what I have, however, is six minority students out of that 120 student. One of them, and I'm giving you an example of my uh, past fall course. One of them was a transfer student. At the end of the semester, five of six minority students received a C or lower grade in the course. Five of <coughs> six did not come to have a conversation with me about their bad grade, which was weird to me because I thought for sure day one they were going to flock to me and say, help, help us out. Five out of the six were completely not active in the classroom. And this five out of six had not had a Meyerhoff-like experience again because it doesn't exist at Michigan. Question is, what happened to the sixth student? Why isn't he in this category. As I mentioned, I had one transfer student. That was the sixth student who got an A in the course. It turned out that he transferred for Morehouse College. So he's had a version of all the things that I highlighted that was critical to the success of the Meyerhoff program. He's had a community. He's had mentoring. He's had people telling him he could do it. He was the only one out of six that was active in class, that sought out advice and help, and he was the only one that did well. So this, for me, was actually, my classroom I thought was a research environment to actually highlight to me the importance of the Meyerhoff component. And I'm gonna stop there. I want to thank all the panelists. I mean, they all individually gave some very, very good information. Um, I am supposed to summarize this, and I'll, I'll do my best. But, but let me say that I think what we all saw was that uh, most individuals at schools that had the opportunity to did uh, agree that there were parts at least parts of the um, Meyerhoff experience that they could replicate uh, in their, as a program or within their classroom discussion. I think it's also safe to say that uh, this, the piece of adaptability, though it wasn't stressed throughout, there were certain things that individuals said that indicated that there was ne never, there was not a real true replication, but certain, certainly an adaptability. We further saw that all components of the program must involve the entire uh, university. And in cases where that was not occurring, uh, I don't think there was a lot of success. But I'd like to point out uh, a couple of other things. I'd like to, to really thank Crystal Watkins for introducing to me this, this notion of intrusive advising. <laughs> I believe I've done a lot of that. <laughs> but at least uh, I appreciate the fact, Crystal, that you said it, it's, it's needed. Mm -hmm. So at least I know now <laughs> what I'm doing. Because so often you can, you can tell on an individual's face you know, whether or not they are really embracing but I think that the final, in the final piece, you, you will see whether they have embraced it or not. Um, I think that there were some real key factors that were identified. For example, mentoring is being really, really key. Uh, the, the Summer Bridges program is being really, really key. This whole uh, component, the community, uh, studying with individuals, uh, 
And, th and then that's social, as it relates to the social component as well. So I think that I was supposed to ask if there were any questions. I'm not certain if we have time. I think we do have time for a couple of questions. So yes. More of a, of a comment, but listening to all these wonderful programs that have evolved out of the Meyerhoff program, which I wasn't aware of, I'm looking at these students from Winston-Salem and thinking, these are our cousins. <laughs> and that's amazing to me. And we've, we've been talking about the power of networks. Um, and it just occurred to me that there would be great power in having meta networks between all of these different programs, especially given the difference in age between the programs. So a program that's as young as the one in Winston-Salem may not have people who are in the position of Crystal or myself or people who are now further along in their career and they could benefit from that. And likewise, I'm always looking for new mentees. So just throwing that out as a um, component of replicating this program, that we can start a meta network, be that on line or some way that if someone has interest in marine conservation, I'm your gal. And if you're Meyerhoff, if you're some other, other program that's related to the Meyerhoff program and that vision and Dr. Rabowski's vision, then we should start connecting. Very good. And you know, there is some of that connecting because I can see it when I go around and I meet students in one school who they know students in another school either through the, the summer experiences they've had together. So there's some of that going on. I just think we need to increase it more. And I thank you for bringing that out. Yes. I'd just like to make one comment. Uh, some of you may know Christina Jones, who came to work with Dr. Uh, Summers last summer. Some of you, Meyerhoff. I see some heads shaking. Well, that young lady is from my program at LSU. She was all excited to be here working with you guys and say, oh, Dr. Warren, I met a bunch of Meyerhoffs, and that's all she would talk about would be the Meyerhoffs. <laughs> that young woman is, is absolutely outstanding, and, and I'm trying to send her to one of the best graduate schools. And she's destined for graduate school. She's going to do well. Yeah. A question over here? It's a comment. I know probably what some of you are wondering about is we're talking about replicating Meyerhoff at the undergraduate level. And yes, the components work as you put them in place. But what about graduate school? Will you find graduate schools that have the same kind of elements that have been so important to you as undergraduates? The answer is yes, you will. You will find graduate schools that believe you can be nurturing and challenging at the same time. They're going to help you meet your highest expectations and go beyond those, but at the same time, provide that support that you've had in the Meyerhoff. They do exist. So what are the things you look for? You talk to the students in a place and see what they say. But there's something else you can look for when you go interview. Is there a box of Kleenex on the desk for people? Because the truth of the matter is you're going to need that when you go to graduate school at some point. There will be problems that arise. There will be failures. And I hear people who say failure is not an option, and I say, get out of science now. <laughs> we, we face a lot of failures in science, and the issue is, can you get over it? So look for the box of Kleenex, look for some friendly people, and talk to the students, and there will be programs that understand that the principles that have guided the Meyerhoff program work in other places, especially the study group concept and the support and close mentoring. Yes, sometimes maybe it does reach the point of intrusive, but it's the kind of thing where you can go in and talk to people about whatever is happening in your life. So yes, it's not just at the undergrad level. People are catching on and doing these kinds of things at the grad school level too. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I just wanted to do that in general. I'm Gail Slaughter from Baylor College of Medicine. We've had a number of Meyerhoff scholars with us and students from all over the country. And we lost Crystal, Christine Jones. She was coming to my summer program, but, <laughs> but <laughs> she won the Merck Fellowship. And as part of that, she has to go to Merck for the summer. Yeah. So we hope we'll see her back later and a number of students. And I see Meyerhoff's here that have been in our program who are moving ahead. So yes, there are graduate schools that are, that are in fact excellent places, but are also very nurturing environments. So just look around for them and you will find them. Sorry, they certified <laughs> Who's 
just got through lots of boxes of Kleenex. Did you? So did 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 you bring your book? So so. So I'm Beverly Hartline from Delaware State University, and I don't know if everybody has your book, Dr. Slaughter, but they probably need it if they don't. Um, anyway, <laughs> she tells me she tells me she has a new CD revision of her book, which is called Beyond the Beakers, um, which is wonderful mentoring advice for undergraduates, for graduate students, and for faculty others who are working with them. So the question I have is, I think it was you, Lola, who said that um, fixating on PhD as a destination started from day one. I really resonated with that since that was part of my background since I was about three. Um, and when somebody said when I was 13 that I was never gonna get a PhD because I was female, I decided he had to be wrong. And therefore, no matter what happened, I was gonna get a PhD, no matter what in. But what I was wondering is for the other programs like uh, you, Isaiah, um, at Bates and everything, t t for how many of you is helping the students fixate on the PhD as their ultimate destination, a really key ingredient from day one? Well, I'd, I'd love to speak to that. So at Cornell, w when we look at our entering class of freshmen and we ask how many of them want to go to medical school, we get about 80% of them that put up their hand and say they want to be doctors. And so we begin talking freshman year right away about alternate, there are other options for you. There's another key group here though, and that's parents. And so again, that's something that Meyerhoff has, has engaged and they, they're part of the experience. Um, we have challenges where when a family's paying $40,000 a year for their child to go to Cornell, they don't want us telling their child that they should be a mere PhD. So back to what society needs to do, we need some role models out there. We need these Meyerhoff students to go on and be effective role models, and we need a TV series with uh, Dr. Rabowski on it. <laughs> HBO will be calling. So, so, so I should say that I'm one of those parents who pay $40,000 a year for a child to go to Cornell. Thank you. <laughs> And, and I was really offended because they didn't even name a doorknob after me. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd say at Bates, I didn't have time in my talk to talk about the mentoring piece, but that's uh, one thing that um, is part of our program and actually is part of the college as a whole. So yes, uh, convincing people that graduate school is for them, um, that starts early. It's not necessarily all PhD in research, because we're okay if people get MDs. <laughs> um, but part of that is because uh, a strong part for us is community-based participatory research. And we understand that in uh, overcoming health disparities, that kind of research will be important, and it will be just as important for MDs to be involved in that kind of research as <coughs> PhDs. So, um, yeah, we, we push right from the beginning. Uh, in terms of LSU, uh, it is a requirement that our, our students come in the program that they aspire to get a PhD. Since we're modeling after the Meyerhoff program, that was the way I convinced the federal agency to give us funding. We will not get funding if they continue to go to medical school. So far, we've had a great deal of success. As one young woman who came into our program told us we were wasting our time because she was going to medical school regardless. Well, that's the young woman who won the Gilliam Fellowship and now doing her PhD at, at uh, Wake Forest University. <laughs> so we've had tremendous success. Well, I have a question. I have a question. It may sound a little odd from a federal person saying this, but how do you consider talking to the federal people about the fact that we do need physicians we need physicians to do research. And it turns out that most of the physicians that I know today at the National Institutes of Health, they're doing research <coughs> and they don't have PhDs. So this is, I'm, I'm saying something, I'm kind of jumping out of the box and saying this, but we have a need 
for individuals to go into medicine as well. I will further tell you that I spent 30 years of my career convincing students to go into the PhD as opposed to the MD. I don't know if that was correct. So we really have a dearth of minority physicians. And someone just mentioned about health disparities. In order to really answer some of these issues about health disparities, we're going to need physicians doing research. So it would behoove those of us who pay taxes to try to convince individuals who develop these programs that it shouldn't be just one way. Uh, could, I, could I address that? <laughs> First of all, the MD is not a research degree. Yes, there are some physicians doing research, but the, it is not a research degree, and invariably people heading for simply the MD as opposed to the MD-PhD, they're not going to go into research. The PhD is the terminal degree that trains you for research. And if you are going to study and make a difference, for example, in AIDS, Yes, you can treat patients, but the real difference is going to be made by the person doing the research that's going to find out what is the cause of AIDS and what's going to get rid of AIDS. I understand that philosophically, but I'm telling you what I know, <laughs> that the people, the head of the NIH is an MD. The head of most of the institutes who are doing top-notch research are MDs. So I'll leave that alone, but I just wanted well, to say that. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me ask you. Um, Let's take her question. Yeah, she has a Whoa. question. Take, she has a question. Make sure that I punish you some way when this is all over. No. Actually, actually, I was going. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, but I do think uh, I, I do think Marion is dealing with the reality base, and I would yes, ask is, you one is. of the things that I have been most struck by through the Meyerhoff is the large number. Uh, of, of students who go on to get the MD, PhD. Do you think that that's a path? It's a long-term path, but it is a path that, that helps address both of the, the important aspects that you... I don't want Freeman to beat me. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes, I see. <laughs> well, no, no, it's not. Well, yes, okay, yeah, okay. we'll say that, we'll say that. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> Research and, and many will tell you, Saul Snyder, Elias Zerhouni will tell you that it was not the thing to get an MD PhD 35, 40, 45 years ago. Right. Some of the best researchers in the country now, as you know, are getting MD PhDs, but those from who are old, 50 some years old and older, had MDs. They did not have, and they were doing the research. There's no doubt that we need more physicians who do research also. We do. We really do. What I say to the national agencies right now is, though, that if we don't produce the PhDs, we don't get the money to even continue the program. That's, that's, right. that's the first of point, course. whether it's NIH or NSF. They're looking for us to produce PhDs. And what I was told by NSF, NIH, and, and Sloan was we still haven't figured out how to do it. So we need the PhDs. We need the MD PhDs. We need strong MDs, too. We do. And we need people to give us money to produce MDs. <laughs> that's the point. We're not getting that's the what money I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you want to take it. And I promise you, I won't punish you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Laura Dykes, and I'm a new postdoc here at UMBC. And I wanted to comment on the situation at U of M because I am a U of M grad. And I did have some of the components of the Meyerhoff program, not under the name, but I was part of a program called ALVA, where we did internships the year going into the um, going into freshman year, and we also participated with the students that were in the bridge program. We also had um, study groups, and uh, the freshman year we were sat down and we were told, you need to sit in the, talk to your professor, you need to sit in the first row, you need to be present. And it saddens me to hear that these programs are no longer in existence at U of M, and I'm wondering if this could be because of the outcome of the court case. <laughs> Well, so I'll take a stab at that. It, it, the, so one of the discussion we've been having amongst uh, some of the older Meyerhoff students is relating to that, that how did the court case impact or affect the Meyerhoff program? I, I, and part of the reason I brought up the example of the transfer student from the um, Morehouse is 
the, the one of the strengths of the Maya Hof program to begin with was that strong community of people generally from the same background coming together and empowering each other, right? And with the court case, you could argue that an aspect of that goes away because you have now to think of multiple <coughs> types of background and multiple types of people. <coughs> and and not, unintentionally, I would argue, perhaps it's not as an easy task to sit down and have conversations about, remember when we were on the street of Baltimore, you know, so and so almost got shot, but we're, we're now here, you know? So that goes away, and, and one could argue that ha that might have had some um, negative um, impact on some of the students that are now going through the program. <laughs> My name's Derek Scott, and I'm at the University of Michigan. And I know the young lady here, <laughs> and we've just met. <laughs> yes. We know you're here. Yes. Unfortunately, chemical engineering is not, no, 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 when you were there. So, so, so our problem is scale. The reason why I'm sitting here listening to this conversation has to do with, because we have components that, and they still are in existence. Prop 2 has not destroyed them yet. It's a fight, it's, it's major. Uh, it, it will have some <coughs> tremendous downsides, mm -hmm. which is why we're again sitting here. There, our problem is that we have a lot of students. And so we have students that are involved in Meyerhoff type of initiatives in the summer. We will have about 100 students for the 25th year that will be on campus this summer for six weeks. But there, but there will only be half of the students, the minority students, that will be a part of that. So how do I, how do I that other half that, will, that does not have those kinds of experiences, how do, you, how do you scale it up so that they don't all land in her class <laughs> all at once? And then, by the way, the Morehouse piece is part of us trying to work on that. A, a partnership now with the dual degree program mm -hmm. in Atlanta, surging a whole new set of students that come through a 3-2 mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. and trying to revitalize that community. Mm -hmm. And you've got, there, sh there needs to be more than one yeah. sitting in your class. <laughs> but, but, um, but, but you do bring up this one question that I at least want to raise and I've been asking around, and that is, how do, how do we position ourselves so that faculty, because I, I want you to make that presentation in front of your department mm -hmm. chair <laughs> and the associate dean, <laughs> right, and the dean, because you hold the, you, you're, you're right, you're behind the chalkboard, and now you have more power than you can know. So if you want to talk a little bit about faculty involvement and how how, as you replicate these initiatives, how have you sort of positioned yourself to make sure that the, where the power lies, how have you gotten faculty involved in this? I think that I have had this red sheet up for a good mm -hmm. while. <laughs> so what I'd like to do, for those of you who would like to speak with uh, the gentleman there, do that. But I do want to close. I want to thank all of you for your attention and congratulate you again. Sayo, Papayote, and chemistry.